Hi, I'm Rafael Gomez, host of TLN Speaking Freely, and now interviewing Toronto's mayoral candidates for what looks like one of the most contested elections in Toronto's history this June. Today, we have Brad Bradford, a council person from the current City Hall. Uh, his riding is in the southeast corner of the city, the beach or the beaches, and he's decided to take his knowledge of the city and now run for mayor as well. So thank you for joining us, Brad. My pleasure to be here. So Brad, as I've started these interviews, and we're interviewing a, not everyone, there's 43 people <laughs> in this race at present, maybe 40. Today, maybe even more. And yeah, to wait a day and we'll have more, more members. But we're interviewing a few of the persons that uh, have been around politics for a while, or at least have been in the public eye and who have thrown their hat in the ring and um, whom we feel can speak to a broad array of different coalitions that might be voting for different people. So you're one of those uh, persons. Um, but I've started these interviews by letting the candidates speak for themselves, at least at the beginning. And it's an important question because you have to ask people, why are they in this race? You know, and as you said, as more people get in, the challenges probably get higher. You had a very good reputation, I think generally, on council uh, as being some kind of a moderate that brought people together. You were obviously very well liked in your riding. And I think you even said, you know, I'm not in this to be a career politician. You even said there's a term limit, a self-imposed one, if I got that right. Mm -hmm. So why would you do that? Why are you in this race? What do you want to do for the city? Well, look, my name is Brad Bradford, and I'm the current city councillor in beautiful beaches, East York, Coxwell to Victoria Park, the lake up to Sunrise, just south of Eglinton. And I'm an urban planner by training. I used to work at City Hall. I was there for a number of years. And, you know, I was frustrated with all of the bureaucratic silos, the disconnect between our policy objectives and what we actually delivered for Torontonians. So in 2018, I ran for council. I was successfully elected and I spent four years on council, pushing forward all of the things that I think are important, supporting our small business community, building more affordable housing, getting the city moving. But I can tell you, it didn't take four years to diagnose the problem. There's a lot of talk at City Hall. There's a lot of debate delay, deferral, indecision, and it's time for a strong mayor of action. We need someone who is committed to less talk and more action, and I think Toronto is at a breaking point, and the opportunity I've had to go across this big, beautiful diversity over the past number of weeks and engage in listening, hearing from po people about their hopes, their aspirations, their dreams for this city, uh, and how City Hall has felt short mm. on, on meeting those. So I'm here to be a strong mayor of action and deliver on the things that will make a tangible difference for you and your family in your life here in this big city. Um, so that's good. And the themes are obviously are ones that you propelled you into politics in the first place. And now you see this opportunity to do that as mayor. We certainly can't call you a career politician. As you said, you got in 2018 and uh, felt that uh, that was enough time for you to see the issues that you think you can move the needle on as mayor. Important to bring to light where we are here, because I want to shift the focus. And you mentioned something there about the challenges the city's facing. We're, we're t taping this, for those of you uh, across the country, in a northwest part of the city. What used to be called the inner suburbs, or the, uh, the outer suburbs at one point of the city of Toronto. And in fact, the city of Toronto was made up of many cities. Uh, we would have been in North York uh, back in the day. It was a separate city, as was Scarborough, as was the city of Toronto itself. And we were governed as a metro structure. That all ended in the 1990s, well before you got into politics, but I think there's still a vestige of that need to understand the city and its many localities. This is a very multicultural city, but no more so than even in this neighborhood where we're filming this. How do you reach out? Uh, the beaches, as you described, is a very beautiful area of the city. I'd say it's, it's on the more homogenous end of sort of its cultural characteristics, demographics. How do you speak to those challenges that the city faces if someone's living in the northwest part of the city uh, versus the northeast? Do you think you can make that overture, if you will, and understand local issues in that way? Well, I think so. And, and Toronto is a big city, 640 square kilometers. You know, more than 3 million people choose to call Toronto home. And if you want to live here, we want to have you. And that needs to be our approach. But again, with all that diversity, uh, you know, a city of neighborhoods, the issues are not necessarily uniform. And you need to engage in listening, meeting people where they're at, understanding where they're coming from. Um, you know, I found on council there's 
there's a lot of uh, folks who will assume a, a position of moral superiority. I've never won an argument uh, by telling someone that their view is invalid. Uh, I don't make friends by sticking my finger in somebody's eye. Uh, you do have to listen. And, mm. you know, just on our way up to the studio today, uh, you know, there was a lot of congestion. There was mm. a lot of traffic. Uh, Lawrence is a busy street. And time and time again, as you move around the city, in the downtown, in the suburbs, you find yourself in an intersection, mm. cars blocking the intersection, you're sitting there at a green light, you can't move forward. That stuff is universally frustrating. People are upset about that. As a strong mayor of action, I will take steps to address the congestion and unlock the gridlock. Mm. It's about listening to people and understanding what their concerns are and really delivering on that. And I think for far too long, the echo chamber of City Hall uh, has been very disconnected from what folks think up here in the northwest part of the city or, you know, the, the northern mm. part of my riding, which is mm. the old borough of East York. Right. So I'm actually the only councillor that represents, you know, what was historically more of a downtown neighborhood in the beaches, but mm -hmm. also that suburban connection, mm. sharing a border with Scarborough. Uh, I certainly hear from a lot of different folks and that makes me a better councillor for it. Yeah, um, I'll bring the point home. I'll give you a specific. Very uh, good. Last year we taped some shows here and uh, actually, you, you know more about this the, that we should share with the audience. You spoke to my students this year, so I'm mm -hmm. also a professor by day, uh, and we run a program that looks at local economic development challenges. Last year, we filmed a, a show, an episode, and we went to the, str the streets, literally. There's a street here called Marley. You might mm -hmm. be familiar mm -hmm. with it. Full of really diverse, interesting small businesses. Now, this was last year, so they were coming on the heels of the pandemic, the lockdowns. They were hurting. Those small businesses had bore the brunt of our public health response. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think I still hear a clear message from any of the main candidates uh, so far, excepting a, a few that have been interviewed here, to speak to that issue. How are we going to make sure that those voices that suffered a lot, and I think we're still paying the price of some of those, those decisions, um, what specific policies, I'll just put it to you there, to make those changes? Like you said, gridlock in the suburbs, absolutely. The small business who got really, really hurt during the pandemic, how are we going to make that better and that relationship grow? And our main streets are also the places where we can repair the damage of potential crime. If people stop going to the main streets, it invites more disorder and, and so on. So it not only benefits the businesses, I think it benefits our city. Do you have any policies there along that? That spectrum. You're absolutely right. I mean, main streets are the heart of our neighborhoods. And you and, would know in, in uh, the exactly. Beaches, right? You yeah. know, certainly, uh, you know, Queen Street, Danforth, but not just uh, the greatest hits in the East End, all across the city. Mm -hmm. You know, Bathurst, Lawrence, Eglinton, um, you know, Keel Street. These are the hearts of our community, and we identify with those main streets, right? Uh, everybody talks about wanting to spend time, you know, in the cafes and the yeah. restaurants, the local artisans. We need to make sure that we are supporting entrepreneurs who are investing their time, their talent, and their treasure mm -hmm. as local entrepreneurs and, and you know folks engaged in small business practice here in Toronto so that they have a shot to make it. Mm -hmm. There's no harder job out there than you know being an entrepreneur in a small mm -hmm. business, and yet the city of Toronto time and time again puts barriers in place that actually makes it harder to do that. Mm -hmm. I want folks to come to the city and build businesses because it's good for our economy, uh, but it's also great for our neighborhoods. So during the pandemic, I was tapped to lead the small business task force, and I met weekly uh, for 90 minutes every Tuesday with the 84 different BIAs across the city. These are the business improvement areas that represent the small independent businesses. That's right, and, and we have 84 and growing here in the city of Toronto and I would hear directly from them and their businesses about all the challenges mm. that they were up against uh, you know the health restrictions the mm. lockdown the cash flow issues the mm. insurance issues mm. a myriad of challenges for our small business owners and uh, you know we worked collectively with other levels of government to fine-tune the programs and the supports to put them back on level ground to your point though you know we're not fully back and actually for the small business community it's it's perhaps even more challenging right now because the supports have been turned off mm. Um, but but everything's not back to normal. You look at the inflation, uh, costs of goods, all of that stuff can't be directly passed on to consumers, mm -hmm. um, but they're taking a haircut. It's more expensive. So, you know, for small businesses, I worked with the provincial government to institute a small business subtax class, mm -hmm. which we will, as mayor, I will continue to support and pass that savings through to this our small businesses. This is a lower businesses. tax that if you're a certain size business, certain scale, you won't pay the same rate as someone who's... Yeah, this is the classic problem, you know, if if you're a mom and pop shop on a main street before you were taxed at the same level as a downtown office tower. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and that never made sense, uh, obviously. They're two different things, but we just had one tax ban. So and the city brought this in as a temporary relief. You're saying you're going to make it... We're going we're gonna to continue to pass that 15% savings on to, mm. to our small businesses, uh, you know, when I'm mayor in perpetuity, mm. because mm. I think that's really important. And like I said, you know, it's never been harder to be a small business in this city. Mm. And so we need to get back to how do we support local business, listening to to the entrepreneurs about the supports they need, whether that's that's part Parking or our cafe TO program mm -hmm. or some tax relief at a time when cash flow is really tight and also investing in our main streets to help beautify them mm -hmm. create destinations across Toronto not just in the downtown mm -hmm. but across this big beautiful city so that people want to go and visit the different neighborhoods support the arts um, so that they are creating vibrancy on the streets as well yeah. working with local businesses to do that together absolutely that's the, the heart of local tourism right if someone from the farthest west end comes to the east end, it's like a different city, so. Yeah, yeah. And, and during this process yeah. of, of running for right. mayor, uh, you know, I get to go all over the city and and, um, and see those different main streets and meet local business uh, entrepreneurs and hear from them about their challenges and they tell me time and time again, Brad, you know, uh, affordability is a mm -hmm. huge pressure for me. My costs are going up mm -hmm. as a small business and it's harder and harder for people to get to my store. Absolutely. Where to fix those things. So a related theme, but it's broader. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the small business community has also said they're being affected by the perception and also the reality of the social disorder that's mm -hmm. emanating and spilling onto our main streets. Yeah. Crime, criminality, perceptions of safety are all going in the wrong the wrong direction. I think you would admit, and you know, as a council person, you're not in charge of all that, but uh, I think you're running because of those issues have come to light. Right. How do we, what are some of your policies on not just fixing the perception, but the reality that there is something that's gone wrong in Toronto. There is um, main streets that, in part because of the pandemic, are a little too empty and therefore are inviting more of this sort of disorder and the criminality and the violence, to be, to be frank. There have been uh, eruptions of violence in communities that have never felt it, and that's, that increases the perception. It's horrible to say, but when, when violence becomes inculcated, there's a different tolerance level, and then when it spills over, it suddenly makes the, the press. It shouldn't. It should mm -hmm. always be a top-of-mind uh, subject. What policies have you brought to the table in terms of dealing with that issue here in the city? Community safety is something I hear about at the door, on the phone, in the inbox all the time. And it affects us in our neighborhoods. It affects us in our main streets. It affects us on transit. Um, you know, people don't feel safe in the city right now. So you're now. admitting that? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, yeah. let's have some humility and let's mm -hmm. acknowledge the problem. Let's not mm -hmm. pretend that it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. You know, you've had far too much about it at City Hall for too long. People mm -hmm. just sort of brushing people's concerns mm -hmm. to the side and trying to talk about something else. You know, let's have a conversation about community safety. And let's also acknowledge what we've been doing hasn't been working. You know, there have been tried and true approaches to policing and community safety. And I would ask you and, and the viewers, like, have we gotten the outcomes that we're looking for? Is the city safer today than it was 10 years ago? The answer is no. And so when it comes to TTC safety, you know, we're recognizing that we need an enhanced security presence on the TTC right now. Anyone that tells you otherwise is, is totally disconnected from what people are feeling. I, I ride transit all the time, whether I'm on the line two uh, going east and west or line one going north south, um, you see it on the station platforms. People's backs are against the wall mm -hmm. because they feel like there's a real risk that they could end up on the tracks. Head down, the body language, no one wants to engage. Mm -hmm. You can't take the streetcar without uh, you know, a reasonable chance of seeing an open air drug deal. Mm -hmm. Again, let's, let's call it out and be honest about the, the, the problems and let's get real about the solutions. So I, I have- So the solutions are? So the solutions are, we will add uh, and return our special constable presence mm -hmm. across the TTC network targeting areas of hotspots and concern. Again, you have to have that presence in the station on the network mm. to, to stop crime before it happens. We will support them by the additional frontline police officers that we included in our budget that I supported this year, $48 million increase, which brought 200 new frontline officers to the Toronto Police. We will take some of those resources and have them work hand in glove with mm. our special constables on transit. Mm. We will add um, screen doors platform edge doors in our busiest stations. Hmm. We're gonna start with the busiest stations because again, some of those platforms are very narrow. This is the technology that can kind of open yeah. up when the train comes in and close down. And again, like why hasn't Toronto done this? We've uh, talked- Other cities have, yeah. Other cities around the world have done this and we have talked about it literally for 15 years in this city. 
And, and many of my colleagues who have been on council and some of the folks running for mayor, they've been there for those conversations. This hasn't gone forward. We will start at the busiest stations, not all 70 plus, but we'll start at those busiest ones. We'll get that done. And then lastly, we're gonna stand up a new coordinated team based on the mobile crisis response teams that our hospitals use, mm -hmm. uh, coordinating nurses and mental health practitioners with special constables or police officers. To, and we will de deploy that across the TTC to make sure that people get the help when and where they mm -hmm. need it. Whether that's someone experiencing mental health crisis, uh, someone who's experiencing homelessness, or somebody you know who uh, is engaged with substance, uh, substance use on the TTC. Those mm -hmm. things are happening, let's be honest, and let's put real solutions on the window to actually make it better. Okay, that's good. I was like looking for that kind of specificity. I know you thought through these ideas and uh, that someone was mentioning that just the, the totality of, of that investment, uh, if you put a, a constable on every station, it would uh, would be like 70 officers, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you think of a force of how many thousands uh, in the city? Of our police yeah, officers, yeah. we're just under 5,000. 5, 5,000, you can't find 70 that right. could make a press. So that's, that's really, uh, I think, useful. Um, a related theme too, mm -hmm. we're dealing again with some of the after effects of the pandemic, the mm -hmm. lockdowns. So part of the order and disorder it shifted to the TTC, but we were unaware of it because we weren't using it. Mm -hmm. Some of our homeless shelters were closed or uh, the capacities were reduced and we just put people into a mobile homeless shelter for two years, right? Yeah. Allowing them to sort of stay in the TTC uh, for longer than maybe we should have. So you can see why that is a consequence of the last two years. The other consequence, I think, has been um, a rush to fix some of the ills. I mm -hmm. get it, housing mm -hmm. shortages and so on, building assisted living in, in communities uh, where we have the potential infrastructure. Yes, mm -hmm. probably important. But the flip side is local democracy. We you know we talked earlier about how the city is really diverse, multicultural, and also very different by neighborhood and by, by former city. Mm -hmm. When we rush to fix these problems and we shortcut the local consultation, it can also breed actually more nimbyism, more alienation. How do you get around that? Because we, you're right, we need projects to go forward. But we also can't forget about the de democratic um, issues that make city life important and get buy-in from the local. Do you have any strategies for that? How do you invite people's opinions without just obstruction all the time? Do you have a, an idea around that? Well, you know, I'm going to be a strong mayor of action. Mm -hmm. And a strong mayor means someone who's not afraid to make a decision, mm -hmm. even if it's an unpopular decision. A strong mayor is someone who is prepared to stand on the floor to council and debate the issue um, with somebody and, and, you know, follow through on that. And a strong mayor is somebody who is also going to make room at the table for dissenting views and opinions and perspectives because I actually <laughs> learn a lot from other people. And so that is always how, you know, I have practiced uh, my politics and my time at City Hall. It was also what I did as a professional planner. Mm. You know, I, I was in the space, urban planning, working at the City of Toronto, where I would go out across the city mm. on a regular basis and, and lead consultation efforts. Projects are better with input from people yeah. and nobody knows your community better than you do. So, you know, there's, there's bureaucrats, down at City Hall and they're sitting on a computer and, and they come up with policies and plans, but that has to be tested and proven in the communities. Mm. You know, I had an instance where, um, you know, there was staff position that wanted to close half of a golf course mm. in our community, D'Antonia Park Golf oh, yeah, Course. Of course, I've used and it as a kid. You used it as yeah. a kid. It's probably the only golf course, municipal golf course located on a subway line. Yeah. It's probably the most affordable and accessible golf course in the entire country. Yeah. It has the highest participation of women who play at that golf course. Mm. Uh, and there was just a unilateral staff decision to get rid of half of it. I'm like, I asked the individual, have you ever been to D'Antonia Golf Course? Mm -hmm. Have you ever been there? Mm. And the answer was no. Mm -hmm. They have never been there. There, you know, there's a perception that, uh, you know, golf courses are a sort of elite a country club sport. Yeah, yeah. If you want to make, if you want to make that the case, mm. then you would get Prove rid it. of somebody mm -hmm. of, of golf course like D'Antonia. So my point is, you have to listen to the community. Um, but when it comes to the housing crisis, when it comes to transportation, when it comes to transit and infrastructure, we have to move forward. You can't stand there on Twitter or in the council chamber and talk about the urgency of this and then go out and engage in obstruction, deferral, and delay. Mm -hmm. We need someone to take action on the big issues here in Toronto and that's what you're gonna get with me as mayor All right. fair enough and I can speak as, as someone who grew up in Scarborough uh, it wasn't the elite and privilege that used Antonia trust me it was uh, it was kids like <laughs> it's, me it's yeah. a golf course for everybody absolutely I like that you said that you're open to debate I think again during the last two or three years people became afraid of debating anything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. out of fear mm -hmm. and that has to change because you make better decisions when you invite more opinions 
uh, more concerns, and the eventual decision is the, is the right one. But I'm, I'm glad you're taking a bold step and saying, if I have to make those decisions that a lot of people don't like, you're, you're willing to do it. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, I've shown that time and time again in, in Beaches East York. Sometimes you have to do the unpopular thing, but it's the right thing. You mm -hmm. know, we built 54 units of supportive housing for seniors, um, and it's the whole premise of, like, we can't have people living in parks. Mm. That's not, that's not acceptable for those people who are living there. It's not acceptable for people who want to use the park. Mm -hmm. Let's give them the dignity of a roof over their head mm -hmm. and wraparound support so that they can be successful. And that's exactly what we did in my community. Uh, wasn't popular at the time. Uh, I took it on the chin. People were very upset about it. But now we've provided housing for 54 seniors. It's mm. been a huge success. And the community's done a 180 mm. and have actually rallied around that building and, you know, come out at the holidays mm -hmm. and engage with the seniors and all kinds of programming across the street at Stan Wadlow. Mm. Uh, and it's actually been really positive. So, you know, the joke is uh, a lot of politicians take the position that the best way to get reelected is to do nothing at yeah. all. And that's why you have politicians who have been at City Hall forever uh, and you never actually get any action on the issues that matter most to you. That's going to change with me. It's time for less talk and more action. Well, with that, we might as well end with a, with a statement from, from you, Brad. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys the next time.